life, gotta make your own deals Chase your own thrills, pay your own bills On the outer loop, sitting on chrome wheels Phone synced up to the newest chrome bills On air, who cares if it's right or wrong? I just care which guests they invited on Without a minute to stall And there was liquor involved with some hype songs And the night is young Right on cue, the talking begins And we check out what Steve Bills got on the blends A bit grimy a backdrop from the late 80s to the mid 90s Till it finally takes us to a rhythm that works And K. Chrome spits a verse that he didn't rehearse Both flex skills proving it's all in So gather around for the newest installment Chrome Bills Episode number Peace Chrome Billionaires This is C's Mike's Chuck is in Italy Italia, as us Italians call it, and uh, I wanted to do an interview with the good people who put together a documentary called The World Has No Idea. It's about Michael Larson, aka Idea. May he rest in peace. I interviewed Brandon Croson, the director of the documentary. I also interviewed Brady, who runs Crush Kill Recordings, Carnage, and DJ Abilities. You remember Carnage from, I believe it was episode 83. Uh, from our interview, he was kind enough to join us again. This is the first time we've had Brandon, Brady, and DJ Abilities. So check out the interview. Please subscribe. Share with your friends and enemies. Leave some feedback and submit any questions, and we'll follow up on interviews in the future. Peace! This call is now being recorded. Peace, Chrome Billionaires. This is C's Mikes. And right now, I have the honor and privilege of speaking to a man named Brandon Croson. He runs a company called Son of Crow Productions. It is a video company. And he is currently on the road, if I'm not mistaken, for a film that he made, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. It is called The World Has No Idea. It is a film about the life of the homie idea, rest in peace. And actually, right before we got on the phone together, Brandon said that he's had quite a few things. I'm sorry. Brandon said he's had quite a few things happen today. So. With no further ado, Brandon, how are you? And tell us what's happened today. Good, man. I'm good. How you been? Uh, things are good. Great. Yeah, no, it's been, uh, well, like, uh, I just got done. I finished negotiations with the Prince Charles Theater in London today. So, like, we haven't nice. announced it on the way. Yeah, London. I'm excited about that. Uh, we haven't announced it yet, but uh, February 1st is when the London premiere is going to happen. And then uh, there's a Portland Theater. I just finished rapid negotiations with today too that's looking like that's going to be january 28th i'm going to announce that on the internet tomorrow and then uh oh chicago we found a chicago theater that's going to do to uh work with us we haven't set a date with those guys yet but the guys the guy confirmed like okay cool we just got to pick a date and then we can get the ball rolling on that so it's an exciting time man it's it's you know it's cool like the uh i've said many times like i used to feel like i was the only idea fan so it's kind of funny to to get to make this film and, and to see how many other, you know, see how wrong I was and how many other fans there are. It's crazy. So uh, just to give the audience a little bit of a background, and of course you can watch the film and you can check out more information at theworldhasnoidea.com. Oh, you can't watch the film there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're just, <laughs> we're just, there. yeah, no, absolutely not. We have, uh, there's a web series people can watch that's available for free for the public. It's like over an hour of footage of stuff that, that should have made it into the doc, but I couldn't make an award-winning documentary that was longer than an hour and a half because that's not how that game is played. You know what I'm saying? So I took the other hour worth of footage and put it on YouTube for free uh, for people in little little segments of webisodes or whatever. But the film itself, you kind of can only watch at, like, uh, the premiere screenings and the premiere events that we do or, like, if a film festival picks us up, that kind of thing. We're going to start selling copies in, uh, in, I don't know, March probably, definitely in the spring. But Okay. Yeah, it's not like out for everyone to just watch yet. And I'm looking at the uh the list of dates where you did uh screenings. Uh it started out in Denver on September first. Um you had yep. the most recent one in Sioux Falls in uh, South Dakota on October thirtieth. Um yep. how did you set up that's quite a few, it looks like it was about was it like fifteen screenings? How did you set that up? Was that you? Did you go through a booking agent? Well, we were working with a booking agent at first because it wasn't like it wasn't just the film. It was the film, and then uh, well, for for a lot of them, I should say, uh, we were doing events where the movie would play, and then there'd be a concert with some of the musicians in the film. And uh, for like the first, 
I don't know, half of those, I guess. Not even the first half, like six of them of the earlier ones we, we had set up through a booking agent. And, you know, long story short, that was kind of a clusterfuck, and you got to be careful who you do business with. So uh, so then a lot of them, so over the course of of learning, you know how, like, you watch someone do something horribly wrong, so then you figure out how to do it right? Right. That's basically what happened to me. <laughs> so, so from there, I started booking all, all the events for us and whatnot, and uh, it's been going. It's been going pretty well, and we're trying to like we're trying to gear more because we're you know we we did the film festival thing pretty well. We've had like a pretty good tour. We're definitely doing setting up more uh, more events, and we're not probably. I'm not saying we're like 100 percent done doing it where it's a movie and a concert, but we're we're definitely trying to do more screenings now where it's just like a screening of a film at a movie theater just because there's like, I have this whole newfound respect for, for indie musicians now having like dabbled in that world and like been a tour manager and like just all of the headaches that comes with that. I'm like, man, don't get me wrong. It was a blast. The, you know, fans loved it. People were happy, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know, man, there's, there's something about just mailing a Blu-ray to a theater and collecting half a check. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, like, it sounds like a much easier way to put food on the table. Yeah, seriously. Oh, seriously. I had a lot of fun, though. I can't... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, speaking of you know indie musicians, and, and we'll get to having fun, uh, you went on the road. I'm not sure how many of the shows featured performances by uh, Idea fans will remember DJ Abilities and Carnage the Executioner. Uh, tell yeah. us about some of the experiences you had on the road with them. And Peace to Crush Kill Recordings, I think Brady and Kathy were both involved with either being at several of the shows or set, helping set them up. Yeah, uh, Brady was... Brady and Kathy were in Denver with us, and then we kind of just did the rest of our the rest of them ourselves. And then uh, the the Minneapolis one... Kathy was at, Brady was at the Duluth one, and then the the Dakota ones, I had Brady kind of run out and, like, handle merch and, you know, make sure the events were on, excuse me, on time and all that fun stuff because I got other stuff to do. <laughs> but uh, right. it's, uh, no, it was it was cool, to be honest. Like, I, I'm a huge Idea fan. I've been listening to, I've been listening to him and Abilities and Carnage since I was a teenager. So to, like, actually know, uh, you know, so many of those artists on like a first name basis now is still, it's still weird. Like I'm used to it now, you know, but it, but it's still, I don't know, it's still weird. Like I'll randomly get an email from somebody and be like, ah, this ability just emails me like no big deal. You know what I mean? Like, yes, that's kind of cool. Absolutely. That's been yeah. one of the cooler things about doing uh, this podcast and just, you know, shows in general, uh, but it's crossing paths with people that, you know, a younger me would have gotten such a kick out of interacting with. And, you know, so I yeah. can definitely relate to that. Um, how did you get involved with uh, working on this particular film? Uh, Kathy and I had some mutual friends. Kathy, Idea's mother, uh, and I had some mutual friends. And, you know, I, just me being a, a huge Idea fan, we kind of sparked up a friendship. And, you know, at some point she asked, she was uh, working on a co- like a concert footage collection kind of a thing. And she wanted me to transfer some old VHS that she had of Mike performing to digital. And I was like, sure. And she was like, well, what would you charge for that? And I was like, nothing. Are you kidding me? I get like free idea concert that no one else has. Thank you. Right. So thanks for the present. <laughs> so, uh, so I did that for, and then we got to talking about it when I got her the footage back and I was like, you know, man, if you just let me interview like the right 12 people and take the time to edit it together well, like I'm pretty sure I can make, you know, a, a, an actual like feature link documentary that, that does pretty well because on top of there being an actual demand for the story, I, I didn't think the demand for the story was as big as it turns out it was, but uh, I, I knew that there was a demand for the story and, you know, just as an idea fan and someone that does uh, film and video for a living to be able to make my first feature link film about my favorite rapper is, you know, that's still like, who does that? That's some, that's some, I hit the lottery level type of shit. You know what I mean? I still get really pumped right. about it. But, uh, yeah, so we, we, you know, we talked about it and she was like, cool. And I was like, cool. And I, I went to work on it. You know, she, uh, Kathy's my co-producer. So like every dollar the film makes gets split because I'm a do it yourself filmmaker. Like people who'll hear filmmaker and, and assume that I have this like army of people underneath me doing shit. That's not the case at all. Uh, I write, direct, produce, edit. I do visual effects. I've got other people that take care of my audio for me because I'm not that I'm not that great with that and I've got I'm like branching out into getting other people to run cameras for me or whatever but 
I kind of, you know, I do so much stuff myself. Um, so what I was planning, well, we, like we went to crowdfund for it and we were planning on raising like 6K is what we asked for. Cause I was like, well, this is what I would need to be able to make it in a way to where it goes like straight to video, maybe hits one festival and then I don't go broke making that happen. And, uh, we made that in 48 hours and, uh, by the end of the campaign, we've raised over 20,000. So there was, I mean, there was just a lot more fan love out there than I anticipated. So I took that as a mandate, you know, from the fans to kind of run with this thing as far as it will go. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, we've, you know, we've, we've hit three film festivals as of the 7th. November 7th is going to be our St. Cloud Film Fest screening. And then, uh, we won the Platinum Award from the Spotlight, uh, Spotlight Documentary Film Awards down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, premiered in New York at the New York Hip Hop Film Festival. We were official selection of the Minneapolis St. Paul National Film Festival. And then, you know, like we were talking about before, we did the tour of events and now we're just doing solo screenings. And so it's, I mean, as an indie film goes, I'm, it, it's holding its own. I, I'm really, I'm really proud of, of, uh, of how far it's come. But I'm still, but I'm weird about it too because like, like it's my movie, it's my baby. I put a lot of time and energy into this thing. But this isn't a, a story I wrote and directed myself. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this was a dude's life, and I directed how we presented it or whatever, and uh, and certainly made a, a big effort to wake the fans up. So I'm proud of it, but I'm also like, like when people, I find I find I have instances where I kind of have to like, like I'll correct people. Like someone will be like, "Yeah, you're fans," and I'll be like, "Ah, ideas fans. Those are ideas fans." When people start showing up. Uh, in in mass to see a Brandon Croson film just because it says a Brandon Croson film that's when I can start calling them my fans. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, but, I mean from our interactions too, you know, I, I definitely think you have the right mentality and approach and the right balance between making sure that you get yours, but also showing respect due to the subject of the film. And I also think you. that you know I, you and I have hung out over at Kathy's house. She's not the type of person yeah. that's going to let you sit in the backyard with a fire going unless she really trusts you, you know? Absolutely. So that, that's, it's amazing. I, I remember when we first started building uh, and you were telling me about the film itself, I was really excited to see, A, the film, but see, you know, what kind of uh, momentum you were able to get out of it. And I'm so glad to hear that things have been going well. Thanks, man. Yeah, it, ha- I'm, it has. I, it's, it's really, uh, it's really, it's cool. You know, it's cool and it's humbling and it almost feels not quite real yet or something. <laughs> Still, like, <laughs> right. but yeah. Now tell me about some of the shows. I know uh, anytime you get Carnage and DJ abilities together, some fun stuff's gonna happen. What were those shows like? Oh yeah, he murdered it every night, every night. I love seeing Terrell perform, dude. It's he, it's crazy. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, so Denver, Denver was our biggest event easily, which was weird because that was like the first one that we did. Uh, independent of film festivals where like we, you know, went out and, you know, booked the theater and set the whole thing up. Uh, and it happened like, it just so happened to have happened the day before Atmosphere played their Red Rock show that they do every year that they like always sell out. And, uh, so, you know, I obviously reached out to them and was like, hey, you know, we were doing this, blah, blah, blah. Is there, like, do you, do you guys want to be on the guest list? Like, I'd love to for you to watch the film and kind of give me some feedback. Just because it's, you know, it's it's emotionally it's an emotional di- emotionally difficult thing to watch. I feel for people that for a lot of the people, not everybody, but for some of the people that knew Michael really well, like personally, you know. So I think a lot of those guys are kind of avoiding it. But anyway, so we went down to Colorado and uh, did the first like premiere event where the movie played and there was a concert right afterwards there. And that was, I mean, that was mind blowing, man. I love Denver. I love everything about Denver. It was, uh, <clears throat> we sold out like a 700 capacity, uh, spot. <clears throat> and, uh, and that was just really cool. Like seeing like one of your, one of my favorite things as, as someone that that's trying to tell stories for a living is like when you're, when you see other people watching it for the first time uh, and you see them react the way that they're supposed to react. Like there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a few moments in the movie where I can like, like on cue be like, all right, everyone's going to laugh in three, two, one. And the whole auditorium starts cracking up. And every time, like just watching, like I, and I know where those spots are and everything they are like, okay, everyone's going to be sad in three, two, one. And, and looking at the crowd's reaction and seeing them react the way that I want them to when I want them to 
is what made me feel like I didn't fuck it up. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, somebody that you mentioned, uh, Plug, who we've had, uh, on, uh, as, as an interviewee on Chrome Bill several times, uh, at least twice. Um, but we've had him on a couple of times and talked to him. I know he plays, uh, you had some nice footage of interviewing him, uh, talking about his relationship with Idea. What was that experience like? Oh, that was cool. Cause he's one of my favorite rappers too. I still get like, all hyped up and whatnot about that. Um, yeah, no, Sean gave me a lot of really good sound bites. He, he seemed, he was very, uh, very introspective. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the stuff that he said, uh, beyond just like telling stories and whatever and favorite memories and that kind of thing, his, uh, he definitely had the, the philosophical point of view that I wanted to, that I wanted the story to have, you know, like it, it becomes more about, uh, about, acknowledging people's suffering. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, and I really felt like Sean gave me a lot of really great sound bites in regards to that. Like a lot of really, really good quotes, quotable lines. Um, but I mean, you know, that's what he does for a living. So, <laughs> right. 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 yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, I know Sammy one head, Sammy one hand. Uh, it's also in the film. Uh, who's the yep, you, movie? you're in the I film. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Got you in there talking to, uh, talking about uh, when you guys were in Seattle. I use that story, the Seattle story with the dog in the rain and all that. Right, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Yep. But uh, so you, Isid, Sammy Warmhands, uh, Joey Alpha from Slot Musket. Okay. Uh, Carnage, obviously. DJ Abilities, obviously. And then beyond beyond that, just a lot of people that were close to him personally. You know what I mean? Like I, I feel like like every fan assumed that the doc was going to be all musicians that he toured with or something. You know what I mean? But you know, I'm trying to tell a man's life story, so the the guy that he'd been friends with since first grade probably has a lot of stories that like you know someone like Aesop Rock doesn't have right. to give me. You know what I mean? So. And we wanted, and you know, frankly, I, I, you only got you only got an hour and a half to tell twenty seven years or twenty eight years of life story. So, you know, we we uh, we didn't go. We're, I mean, we definitely have a lot of musicians in there, but it's it's also I think it's like an even mix. It's like a lot of musicians and a lot of like behind the scenes people and and just friends of his that knew him before he really you know got into music all aggressively and everything. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, listen. One of the uh, things that I've always enjoyed about my friendship with Idea was the people that I met through him. Uh, you being one of those people, definitely at the top of the list. I think what you're doing to keep his memory alive is just, it, it goes beyond words. Uh, and I know that I'm joined by a chorus of a lot of people saying thank you. So thank you very much for everything that you're doing. Uh, we look forward to being able to see the film. Are you guys going to come out to the East Coast at all? Man, that I'm trying. I'm honestly trying. We were trying to set up events. We were trying to do uh, a tour we were planning on doing a tour of events out on the East coast where, uh, you know, where like of events events where it's like a, the movie and then a concert, but it's like, I don't know, man, there's so much, uh, so much work involved yeah. in that and not, not as much, uh, cause we, cause we gotta be, we want to distribute next year and, uh, we're going to self distribute. Like we've had some offers from distribution companies, but none that I like cause it's really like, you know, from a, from a personal standpoint, like, I, I really like that the film is set up in a way to where, uh, like when it generates money, that money goes to his mother, myself, and then back into the pot to do more stuff. Do you know what I mean? So, so we've gotten some offers from distribution companies, but none that I felt where they were going to put the care into it that I do. So we're just going to self distribute. And to do that, right. To get us up, like we actually like have like a straight, well, step by step. Here's how we get to iTunes. Here's how we get to Amazon. Uh, here's how we make an actual shot at Netflix without anybody standing in the way that requires money point blank. So a lot of the screenings we're doing now, we're doing of with the mindset of trying to, to stack up chips to do that. Yeah. So we might do some East coast events. I mean, we're definitely going to do some East coast screenings or whatever. Uh, and I want to do some East coast events. I've just been like trying to set up as many solo screenings as I can in the meantime, before I like, shift in that direction. Plus if I'm going to like try to set up, uh, events where there's like a musical element of it too, I don't necessarily want to do that in the dead of winter. You know what I mean? <laughs> December so, shows in DC are always a little bit rough. Yeah, I believe it. I believe well, it. That's what everybody keeps telling me. 
anything that I can do to help, I did. one venue immediately comes to mind. Um, so if you want to try to set something up for the spring, I'd love to be involved and try and help and obviously perform at that. But anything that else that me and the Chrome Billionaires can do out there, please give us a shout and let us know. Yeah, man, definitely. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, we we definitely need some – I need some more pull on the East Coast. Like, I was talking to a couple of people, uh, and, yeah, there was just nothing nothing that didn't look like it was going to cost money instead of make it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I remember talking to – my first when I first met Idea, um, I just thought he thought I was just a super talented person. And then eventually uh, <laughs> I had hit him up on MySpace and said, you know, I'd love to do this uh, six-date uh, East Coast run that you're doing with the buildings, and this was like 2008, and it was started in D.C. when it's far up north as Vermont. Um, and you know, when I talked to him about it later, he's like, "Look, I think you're an awesome guy, and you're 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 incredibly talented, but the East Coast is just a dead zone, so we really didn't have anything to lose by having you on it, <laughs> you know." So <laughs> it was one of those things where it, it, it's a lesson to be learned. Um, but I think that what you know about the East Coast, but I think that what you're doing and what you're offering audience is definitely something that. I want to work to help you bring it out here. So we'll see if we can get worked out. Hell yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate that very much. Absolutely. All right. Well, Crumb Billionaires, check out theworldhasnoidea.com. Brandon, thank you for your time. Thank you, man. Um, So I'm going to have Steve edit uh, this little part out. I'm going to hang up and call you back so we can catch up. Yeah, man. Do that. Do that. All right. Cool, bud. All right. Peace. Peace. This call is now being recorded. What's up, dude? How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I've actually already hit four, so we are already recording. And uh, if, you give me, if you give me a second to give a little preamble, uh, Chrome Billionaires, this is Brady. Uh, I don't know if you want me to give out your last name or make up a really cool for your name, maybe Shady Brady. Sure. Um, this is Brady, and he is the... I like to call him the CEO of Crushkill Recordings, and I'd imagine right now he's flying through the sky in a gold-plated jet um, with all the money that he makes in his current position. Would, would you say that's accurate? That's fairly accurate, yeah. Okay. Uh, Brady is somebody who I consider a near and dear friend. Um, I met him when he was the tour manager for Idea and Abilities, and um, after Idea's passing, he was kind enough to let me stay at his parents' house, uh, and we went to the funeral together, and I feel like you know, our friendship is very uh, genuine and sincere, and it's an honor to have you on the podcast for the first time. I wanted to talk to you about your experience with the film, uh, The World Has No Idea. We've already talked to Brandon Croson, and we're going to have a couple other people on. Um, why don't you tell us about the experience you had on the road? Um, well, it's just crazy to see, um, you know, it's six years after the fact, uh, And it's crazy to see how much people still relate to the message and the music of everything that Idea was able to do during his lifetime. Like, being up in Canada and seeing, you know, 150 people come out on, you know, a Friday night in Edmonton where it's like, I don't know, or there's a Saturday in Edmonton, but... I didn't have really any idea that there were that many fans up there, you know? So it's crazy to see night after night people coming up to you be like, oh, this, you know, he changed my life. Like, I never got to meet him, or I got to meet him, you know, super briefly. And it's just night after night of that, kind of with the film, which to me is the coolest part of it, is just getting those to interact with fans and stuff um, who he had this sort of impact on, you know, kind of night after night. And you must have had similar experiences on the road as your tour manager uh, while Idea was still with us. you want to talk about a couple of those? Yeah, it, it's weird, though, how different it is now, though, because a lot of people don't really take into account. I mean, you were on the last Idea and Abilities tour, and the biggest show of that tour was Chicago, where there were, which you guys actually weren't even on that date, but there were, um, like, 210 people there. Yeah. And so for 210 people to be the biggest show of, like, 15 dates or something like that, and then... And actually, you know, you, we things, were, I think we were on that, we were on that date. That was you were on the Chicago show? 
Yeah, that okay. was the one where I think Psalm 1 opened up. Uh, we opened up and then Psalm 1 went on. Um, that actually turned out to be, it was either that or Wisconsin. Um, that was the last time that I actually saw Mike, I think, if, I, if I've got the dates. Actually, no, because we came back out in August to do a handful of shows in the Twin Cities. But we had done um, Chicago, Wisconsin, some other stuff in the Midwest with you guys. Uh, okay, yeah, because I thought you had left the tour before the end of it, but, yeah. I think we were planning on it, but things were going so well that we, we were allowed yeah. to stick around. But, yeah, to have a show in Chicago be the biggest show of the tour, and it's, you know, like six miles away, or six-hour drive away from the Twin Cities, whereas mm-hmm. you have, like, basically like a comparably large show in Calgary, six years after his passing, right. you know, for the, the screening of the movie. So if the interactions are much different in the sense that, uh, you know, people are like, uh, you know, of, of course, I mean, of course they're different because he's, he's not there anymore. So it's like people want to talk to um, abilities and Kathy and show them, you know, like, you know, lyrics they've gotten tattooed or shirts that they've made or um, a lot of times share, like, similar experiences with just loss in general. Um, I think that for whatever reason, the kind of relative level of fame that ID and Abilities had where they're not like Kanye West where you're not going to, you're never going to interact with Kanye West, but the idea of those level of fame where there's, you know, they still seem like real people that there's a lot more willingness on fans part to kind of connect on a more human level on something that has nothing to do with music, which is just loss, like losing friends or losing family members. And I think, you know, almost everybody has that experience and it's a really weird and cool experience to, kind of see that and, and share those experiences with fans in, like, a concert setting. You don't really, it doesn't really happen otherwise. So that, that's always one of the cool things for me is to just, you know, subtract the music out of the equation and just have people coming together um, and just remembering, you know, idea, but also kind of relating their own experiences with loss and with death and, you know, how, um, you know, maybe they, they, you know, like, oh, I lost my friend that I used to go to all these idea shows with and that kind of thing. So it's kind of, it's cool to see that it can be a bigger thing than just I bought a couple CDs a couple years ago and I really liked them, you know. Right. Yeah, his ability to connect people both while he was here and while he's after he's been gone um, was always pretty incredible. And speaking of connecting, uh, how did you first get linked up with? Because I, if I remember correctly, he sort of handpicked you. Yeah, it was it was during that same tour. Um, so that was in the summer of uh, 2010, and I had just graduated from college and was studying for the LSAT at the time, and. Um, he was kind of like, yeah, we've got this new face candy project, and I want to do a lot of um, kind of alternative things with it. Like, he had a lot of ideas about doing um, more, like, house show tours as opposed to, like, venues and um, just kind of things like that where he wanted somebody who was close to him and that to, and that wasn't him because it was, take a lot a lot of like time and energy to kind of dedicate to making the things that he wanted to happen and he was like yeah i really want to get crush kill going again the label and uh yeah that was kind of it was it kind of happened kind of all came about during that tour and then chris was on it obviously as well christoph crane and so it's kind of like okay like we like there's just a lot of there's enough stuff that needs to get done that in relation to the music that isn't the music itself that they needed somebody else to do it and yeah that was, he had kind of hand picked me like at that point yeah, his ability to see things in people you know that maybe they weren't seeing themselves 
I was always impressed with because you were pretty young when that happened too, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was 22. I just graduated from college, and I didn't really have any specific um, experience related, you know, related to that. And I remember even kind of asking him, I was like, don't you know anybody that, had, like, kind of knows what they're doing more? And he was like, no, like, I'll show you what to do. Like, I trust you, you know? And that, yeah. that's exactly what you're saying is that, like, you know, I didn't have a resume that said I could do those things, but he saw that in me before I could even realize it myself that maybe that would be something I'd be good at. And so obviously when, you know, somebody that you've listened to since high school and stuff and idolized to some level, like, says that, like, it means a lot more than almost anybody else saying it to you could possibly. Right. Well, he certainly picked the right man for the job. Um, I know I've done uh, a couple of releases with you on Crush Kill, and with my upcoming EP, uh, will be released with Crush Kill. Uh, I know it's always difficult to talk. Well, at least it's interesting because I think it's difficult to go about your day and have memories of idea and have that not be painful. But whenever I talk to somebody like you, uh, you know, or Kathy or Terrell or Brandon or, or Abilities, it's always cathartic in its own way. Um and I hope that you find the same out of this conversation. No, yeah, it, it's definitely cool to um, kind of have that the, that group of people that's kind of united by it, or unified by that, um, just because it's like, you know, that's an experience that you can't get with fans, you know? Right. Well, I appreciate your time. I believe you're on your way to your day job, are you not? Sorry, what was that? I, you're, uh, I appreciate your time. I think you said, uh, I think you've made so much money by running Crush Guild that sometimes you get bored and you feel like you need to have a regular life. So are you on your way to your day job right now? Yep. I, uh, well, in a little bit here, but yeah, I got to go home and shower, but yeah, basically. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll give you a heads up when this is posted, and we look forward to having you on again. No, yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on here. All right, peace, bud. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. yep. All right. All is now being recorded. Peace, Chrome Billionaires. It's Seas Mike's back discussing the new feature, the documentary, The World Has No Idea. On the line with me now is someone who Chrome Billionaires will be familiar with from episode 83 of Chrome Bills, Carnage the Executioner. How are you doing today? Doing all right, man. Just trying to get some stuff done before I start my tour tomorrow. Busy, but uh, always make time for you, bro. I appreciate it, man. I, well, two things. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate it. Uh, I know you said you had some domestic stuff happen in the background of the house. You had some vacuuming going on that you had to wait, wait through. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, the house got to get cleaned, even if I'm not the one doing it. Absolutely. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so tell me, tell me more about this tour that you guys starting up. By the time I think uh, this is going to post on Monday, um, maybe like a week, a couple, four or five days after uh, the actual interview. So your tour will already be underway. Be sure to tell mm -hmm. people where they can check out footage uh, of the tour as it's happening. Um, they can check out. Um, they can check out what's going on with the tour um, and where it's going on CarnageTheExecutioner.com and um, go to the shows, or I think it's shows or events. I can't remember. I think it's shows link. Um, and then they can, they can see where all the shows are going. Um, I'm putting up a little promo video tonight or tomorrow that shows um, footage of some of the other events I've already done so people can see where the Minnesota Mean Tour 1 and 2 have already gone to and, and what's, what's actually happened. Um, this is Minnesota Mean Movement Tour Part 3. So this is okay. the third in my installment in my installment of uh, representing the Minnesota Mean Movement. So um, it's getting some traction, and I can, you know, pretty much book a tour every three or four months to to promote it. So it's it's a really good vehicle for me right now. So what is I know Minnesota Mean? Uh, I'm assuming it's a play off of the phrase Minnesota Nice. Where did you come, or I guess that's sort of a self-explanatory, how you came up with the the phrase itself? But how did you start to brand it? And tell us a little bit about the tour that's already happened. Well, the the first um, thing I ever heard about Minnesota Mean was um, through breakdancers, b-boys in Minneapolis. 
um, I was um, hosting a b-boy breakdancing event, and I walked past um, one of the vendors, and they were selling uh, this guy, uh, Matthew Birdall, um, really dope b-boy and really good at carving wood. He makes um, all kind of, you know, medallions and sculptures and all these things out of wood. Um, shout out to him. But I walked by his booth and I saw this Minnesota mean um, beaded wooden chain. And I was like, dude, that's dope. How much is this? And he was like, they're 40 bucks. And I was like, okay, after I get paid from this show, I'll come over here and grab one. And he was like, thanks, man. I'm a really big fan of your, your music and all that. Thank you for supporting B-Boys. So I was like, all right, cool. Um, uh, after the event, he came up to me and he just gave me the one I was looking at for free. And he was like, I just want to show my appreciation for you, you know, keeping real hip hop alive. And he gave me the the wooden medallion that said Minnesota Mean on it. And um, I wore, wore it places and people would be like, oh, that's dope. That's a dope little thing. Who came up with that? And I was like, I got it from my boy, Matthew. So then I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Sometimes the Minnesota nice thing isn't really as uh, nice as it's all cracked up to be. So what if I take this, the idea that I got from this chain and flip it and um, start a phrase called Minnesota Mean and start start promoting that? And um, I hit my boy up, Matthew, to see where it originated it, where it originated from, so I could make sure I was giving respect to who came up with it first. And he told me it actually originated with B-Boys in Minneapolis who were break, breaking, and they would be like, when you go to a battle, you have to be Minnesota Mean. You can't be Minnesota uh -huh. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And, and I was like, yeah. So, um, so I, I really even feel much better about it because I'm, I'm helping to further the movement of 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 ele other elements of hip hop that have nothing to do with just the music, and um, represent the b boys. I don't think the b boys and the b girls get enough credit anyway. So, um, it's a twofold thing, and um, it has multi facets, and um, I'm just, I think right now I'm I'm kind of killing it with it because people are really attracted to what the what the logo looks like with my face in it and excuse me what i've able to bit what i've been able to make out of it um it's not just a saying anymore now it's a movement and it's a movement to be the opposite of what people think the negative aspects of minnesota nice are a lot of people when they think of minnesota nice they feel it has to do with uh being passive aggressive um, not expressing your feelings to people directly, but then going behind their back and saying things, backstabbing, um, not being willing to be honest and have that upfront conversation about difficult life struggles with people. And um, I think Minnesota mean is the opposite, and we only call it mean because it's the opposite of what people don't like about about the Minnesota nice thing. So um, I think the whole concept is really appealing to people. And when I put the video out, I had a really good, um, really good response, and I wasn't even planning, like, at one point I was going to do a whole album on it, and I was like, nah, I don't want to focus on it like that, because I think people might take it negative, but when I put the video out, everybody liked it so much, um, it gained traction, and then I was like, okay, now now let me start coming with products to kind of represent it, let's see if, if people are really part of this movement, like they say, and, um, and I wasn't even calling it a movement yet, um, a guy who was doing a lyric video for me, he was like, you got to keep pushing this because you, you have to realize that it's a movement now. It's bigger than you. And when he said that, I was like, oh, the Minnesota mean movement. Cool. Right. So right. immediately I started writing songs to kind of go with that mantra. And then um, I went back to the idea of making an album about Minnesota mean, but then I just called it the Minnesota mean movement. So it has a broader context. Um, and there, therefore people who aren't part of Minnesota, who have nothing to do with Minnesota life or Minnesota hip hop, um, can find some type of resonance with it themselves. And people have actually said to me, they think it's my best material because it, it hits home in so many different ways. I'm so glad I asked. I had, I had a completely different assumption of what it would mean. <laughs> uh, I encourage our audience to go check out CardenceTheExecutioner.com. If only because the logo that you have for Minnesota Mean, it's, it's so dope. It's a picture of your face sort of uh, implanted on an outline of the state of Minnesota. But mm -hmm. the state of Minnesota also as MME. It's a great, it's a fantastic logo. But one thing I wanted to tie this back to was you said it originated with the B-Boys and B-Girls. I certainly agree with you that they don't get the recognition or the appreciation that they deserve. Speaking of which, uh, the subject of today's interview um, is... He's idea. Dope, B -boy. Rest in peace. <laughs> right, yeah, you know, he started out as a B-Boy. 
Talk to me a little bit about your experience with uh, on the road with The World Has No Idea. I know you and Abilities were doing performances, and then they would do a screening of the movie. Is that how it was going? It was the other way around. They would um, okay. they would sometimes have local openers, and then they would do a screening of the movie, which is about an hour and 45 minutes or so, and then they would have uh, performances by myself, DJ Abilities, and maybe some other openers. Um, and sometimes they would have a Q&A, too. Um, about the pe- about the movie, the making of it, um, the people who were involved. So some shows, Kathy, who is Idea's mom, um, was there. Brandon Croson, who created the movie, uh, Son of a Crow Productions, was there. And um, myself and Abilities were there. And um, sometimes questions would, would be asked, and we'd answer questions. And it was, it was a really cool um, – I mean, it was definitely um, – it was definitely touching – you know, in the way that there were there were super high points and there was there were low points too, where you just felt bad. You know, you feel bad that somebody that great is no longer um, able to be exposed to the rest of the the common world, and it's, it's 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 sad to feel like, oh my God, you know, I'll never see this again. But the good part about it is, you know, there are a lot of us who have, have had the experience of of being touched by Mr. Michael Larson, aka Idea, and and we 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 can carry that 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 influence on and his legacy for the rest of our lives um because i think his existence will outlive all of us anyway you know just what he did and it it was it's just i mean aside from the movie the movie was you know a nice aspect um a nice little um visual closing of what his legacy encompassed but um, bigger than that, it's just so, so great to be able to go out and represent somebody so great, you know. Um, and you, you've you been touched by him, too, so you know I'm not I'm not exaggerating when I say what I'm saying about who, who he was as a person. Yeah, I've talked to Brandon, uh, and I've talked to uh, Brady, and we're going to talk to some other people involved with the film. And, and the common theme among everybody is he was just one of those fulcrum people, you know, that mm-hmm. was able to bring so many different people together, so many different types of people. And then he also saw things in people that they didn't necessarily see them in, in themselves. And he easily, was able to bring easily, them out. Yeah. yeah, easily one of the best life coaches that anybody could ever have involved in their in, in their, their up, upcoming and their upbringing. Um, there was a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of things I do now. Um, you know, writing wise and, and show wise and performance wise and just, you know, even taking a stand um against certain things and for other things that um he gave me the confidence to actually do. He would tell me certain things. He would he would point out things in me that I didn't know um were apparent and, and even existed. And um right before he passed I was able to touch on some of those things and I, I think he was able to see what direction I was going in and Unfortunately, he passed before I put out, you know, um, my material that at that point, right before he passed, was my most personal material. But um, I think he, he knew where I was headed, and he gave me the blessing that I was going in the right direction and just told me, you know, you could be one of the best at this type of, of, of hip-hop if you embrace it and just, you know, become more yourself and not as much of a character. And um, that's that's what I walked away with, and that's what I actually encompass now. Now I'm everything. You can see the character. You can see the dark points. You can see the high points. You can see the personal stuff. You can see the dark stuff. Um, every Everything that encompasses who Terrell Woods, a.k.a. Carnage Executioner, is, is very evident in my music and in my live performances and how I interact with people. And I have no shame, and um, I got the no, no shame mantra from idea. If if anybody was able to put their heart on their sleeve and walk with it um, out in the open with the most pride ever exhibited in a human being and in a an all encompassing artist, it was him. You know, so he he's a great example for all of us. Absolutely, uh, I want to tell everybody again: check out CarnageTheExecutioner dot com. I'm looking at the dates now for the Minnesota Mean Part Three tour. It starts mm-hmm. Friday, November 4th, and goes through Saturday, November 26th. It's all in the Midwest. I know we got some Chrome billionaires out in the Midwest. I might start walking now so I can catch one of those <laughs> shows. <laughs> oh, the, the other thing about this cool about this this tour is, um, I mean, I'm I'm pretty much able to brand it as something that continues. It's kind of like a series, and um, people are jumping on it when they see the numbers. They're like, oh, that's there's a third one. Oh, there was there was some other stuff that happened before. I think. Once I get to like five or six, people are going to start doing the research. And um, 
in addition to that, it's easier on on an old man's body to be able to go on tour um, for five for ten days in a row or ten days and not have to do them exactly in a row. So this right. is my Midwest run that I do basically Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays for you know five or six weeks, depending on how many dates I I have time for. And um, it's easier on your body. You get to see your family. You get to hang out with people, and and you don't have to feel like you're bury you're burying yourself on the road the whole time. Yeah, I'm um, looking at the so dates nice, that you cool guys thing. did. I'm looking at the dates that you guys did for the world has no idea stuff, and it looks like it was uh, four or five shows in a row, and then you'd have a little bit of time to chill. Was that uh, pretty rough on the road, or did it go smoothly? I mean, the, the road. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Oh, okay. Yeah, the road is just hard, man. It's 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 a uh, it's fun and it's rewarding, but it is work. And um, you know, people who don't tour don't necessarily um, you know, have the insight on how much work it actually is. You know, getting up super early after playing super late and being super tired and eating crappy food and driving, you know, long making long rides, sitting in a van and you know, sometimes spending money when you don't have a lot of money just to make sure you can eat and survive and put gas in your tank and it's still it's a lot of work so it was kind of cool to be able to do like six seven eight excuse me days in a row for the idea tour and then take a little break come home and get some stuff done do some promo do some shows record do a little bit of um you know other touring and shows of my own and then go back out and do some more idea stuff come back do a little bit more of, of my own stuff and then go back out again so it's, it's actually been um, it's been a lot of work, but it's been very convenient for me because of the way I plan things. And um, I'm making it work, man. I, I plan it out because, you know, that's another thing Idea taught me, man. He was like, you got to treat your music like your job. Like you have to do shifts, you know, and, and I would I would hang out with him. I, I Sometimes I'd be like, I want to come over and hang out. And he'd be like, well, I'm going to be working on work. I'm going to be working on music all day, but you're welcome to come during this time because I'm on my lunch break. I'm like lunch break. What do you, you you make music, man? You just do it whatever you you know want to do whenever you want. He's like, nah, man. I get up in the morning and I work an eight hour shift with a lunch break in between, and I work it just like a job. And I thought that was like the illest shit ever. Yeah, that's <laughs> can amazing. We, can we? I remember can we swear? when I was talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. When I was talking about uh, moving out there, it was like, yeah, you know, that'd be just another eight. You know, I mean, I'm sure that you know with any day job you've ever had, it's never eight, more like ten. But he's like. That'd be an extra ten hours a day, you know, that you'd have to just work on music. And I remember at the mm-hmm. time thinking, you know, like I just end up, you know, doing stupid shit, you know. But if you did, <laughs> if, I think if you came up, you know, and that was your mentality that I had this twenty four hours in a day. Hopefully, I'll sleep for six to eight of them, and then what am I going to do with the rest of it? And he is one of those people that really maxed out what he he was able to do. And I'd say you're on the same path. So keep it up, and absolutely good luck with the tour. I uh, look you, forward Thank to having you out to the East Coast sooner than later. I know that the I talked to Brandon about this a little bit. The East Coast isn't the always the best place, but when we can get you out here, we're going to pack a place for you, man. You're extremely talented, and I hope our listeners go check you out. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we got to do some work. I'm I'm sorry I didn't make it on the last album. Things got crazy busy, but um, we we got some work to do, and um, I, I would like to hit the road with you sometime too. You know, absolutely. And, uh, let's, let's share some tour stories. You know, you know, I'm down, man. I would love to do that. Carnage the Executioner, Chrome Billionaires. Check out CarnageTheExecutioner.com. Thanks for your time, Terrell. Good looking, man. Talk to you later. All right, peace. Peace. All is now being recorded. Peace, Chrome Billionaires. This is Steve Mike. Right now, on the line, I have the honor to talk about DJ Abilities, the partner of Idea. Rest in peace. And uh, as you know, we've already talked to Brandon, Brady, and Carnage about The World Has No Idea, the film and the tour that took place on the West Coast in the Midwest. Abilities, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good, man. Excited to talk to you. Excited to get your thoughts on the film itself and how the tour went. Cool. So tell me a little bit about the film. I still haven't had a chance to see it. I know that you guys did. Was it about a dozen shows? Yeah, I think it was more, actually. Okay. Um, it was, but it, it was around there, something like that. It was definitely a, a good handful. And you play a major part. I know that you and Idea were as close as people could be, being his DJ and he's the MC. Um, what did you think of the film, and what did you think of, uh, you know, the things that you were able to say in the film? And if there's anything from the film you'd like to share with the audience, feel free to do that. I liked it. I thought it did a good job of showing 
different sides of him as opposed to just him being an MC and a rapper. And I thought that was cool, and it shed light on his youth, which I thought was really cool. Like the breakdance stuff was super cool, and there's a lot of just very interesting footage that I think is awesome that people were able to see and experience. Was there footage that you hadn't seen? Because you and Mike kind of grew up together, right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I knew him since he was 13. So, but yeah, there was stuff that I didn't even, I mean, when he was like really young and like the, when he was break dancing in the, there's a scene in the movie where he's break dancing in the grocery store and like I hadn't known him at that point yet. And there's definitely stuff that I had not seen. And then even stuff that I had been present for, it still was, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, it still had a cool nostalgic element to it. It's still. And what about the tour that you guys did? I know you and Carnage uh, were playing, was it after the showing of the film? Yep, they show the movie, and then a lot of times there would be some locals. I think actually every time there was locals, and then it was Carnage and then myself. It was good. It was fun. It was cool to, to feel the energy. There's a lot of love for idea in the room, obviously, given the, the uh, film screening. And it was just nice to have a bunch of people who appreciated him all in the same room. To that end, do you find it cathartic? I know sometimes we live in the memories at first can be difficult, and then when the moment's over, it's a nice experience just to remember him and see all the good people that are remembering him as well. Yeah, the, there was certain elements of it. It's always inherently a certain level of sadness because you're just reminded, particularly the movie starts so positively, and, and then it gets sad at the end for obvious reasons and so it did make the shows there was a that was attached which was kind of difficult but overall the positivity won out in my opinion right and what are you up to now you're i know you're on the road i actually saw um we got a listener who i uh, saw pictures of you with and in, in, on instagram amy brooks uh, were you down in West Palm Beach in the last couple of days? I've been in Florida, yeah. I did Orlando, Lake Park, and then I did Jacksonville yesterday. And then tomorrow is Dunedin. So it's been it's been a lot of fun, particularly Jacksonville. I was like, wow, it's really fun. Really? What was I don't so think I've ever really played there before. Excuse me? What was so unique about Jacksonville? It's not an area I would think of as being a party place. It was just it was just hype. It was just energy. It's all about energy. I mean, that's what makes the show good or bad. Is are people there? Is everybody on the same page? And it doesn't need to be crazy packed. Obviously, usually it's more fun when more people are there. But it's more is everybody on the same page, and is everybody giving their energy? And if that's present, it makes the show so enjoyable. Right. That's what it was last night. So uh, back to the shows for the World Has No Idea film. Uh, did you have a, a routine planned, or were you playing it by ear and winging it for each show? How did you approach that? I mean, I always play with a lot of preparation. It's not – even though I DJ, I, it's, I'm a performer, you know what I mean? So it's not like – I'm not just going to be like, oh, I'm going to play some jams. It's It just doesn't seem to work that way. I have to have stuff lined up that works perfectly that – to make it into a show. So I did pretty much have what I was going to play for those shows and, and, and for any show, for that matter. I mean, I'll change and shift some things here and there, and but there still is a, a basis that's always going to be the same. Just like a rapper would or a band would. You know, you have your set list. You do your show. Right. Well, listen, I know you're on the, you're on the road. You know, you got a precious day off, so we won't take up more of your time. But <laughs> for fans who haven't uh, heard, I can't imagine anybody that's a regular listener of the Chrome and Bill's podcast isn't familiar with your material. If you're not, everybody check out DJ Abilities. Your routines are amazing. You've won pretty much every battle that there is to win. Hopefully you and I hook, will hit the road at some point in the next year or so. And thank you for taking the time out to talk to us today, man. I really appreciate yeah. it. Of course, no problem. You're a good dude. Happy to help. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you soon. Cool. Sounds good. Bye. Peace.